Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome to part three of the truth about the Falchion and Mesa. And what I'll be talking about in this episode is how they were developed. Because this is important, because it's in the way that they were developed that the distinction, the difference between the Falchion and Mesa was established, even though, as we have already discovered in the previous episode of this series, is that effectively and functionally, these swords are actually identical. We will begin with the Falchion. Now, one of the kind of veins of thought that exists out there on the interwebs about why the Falchion was developed was the desire to combine the properties of an axe and sword. And indeed, this is one of the bullcrap things I said in my, you know, bullcrap video about the Falchion. Utterly incorrect. No, ah, ah, so wrong. Okay, no. In fact, the Falchion has more in common with a surgical razor blade than it does with an axe. As to why that is the case, where I, well, I will explain that in the next episode, what the real Falchion and Mesa are, is, or are, is. But for now, I'm just establishing that the development of the Falchion wasn't a desire to make an axy sword. No, it wasn't. The Falchion is most likely an independent development that was not an extension or evolution of any other type of weapon before it. Some have proposed that it is an extension or evolution from the Sax. Sax? Sex? I'm just going to call it the Sax. Evidence indicates that the medieval falchion was developed in the Lombardian regions of southern France and northern Italy. And that is quite the leap away from Scandinavia and the British Isles, which were the areas where the Sax and uh, single-edged bladed weapons were more commonly found. Also, we find the Sax from around the 6th century to the 11th century. And after that, the Sax effectively dies out amongst the British Isles. And there's sort of a blank area with no single-edged weapons in Western Europe till about 1240, the 13th century. Not a single, single-edged sword can be found between around 1050 to 1240. It's like they were just wiped off the map. As to why the sax and single-edged sword seems to have died out around 1050 is a very big question. We don't know why at this time. There's a couple of possible reasons, but we don't know if any of them are absolutely true and it'll take too much time to go into right now. So then, if single-edged swords disappeared, that really does indicate that the falchion could not have been an evolution from the sax because there was such a long period where the sax wasn't even there. So what the falchion really is, is an independent reinvention of the single-edged sword based on experimentation in sword design. The uh, earliest kind of design of falchion, which is the more iconic, you know, falchion blade profile that people think of when you say the sword or name falchion, this is the sword that they will generally think of. And when you look at this design, you will find that it is very sophisticated and it is emphasizing a specific sword quality. Because it's important to realize that this is why the falchion, one of the reasons why the falchion was developed, is that it was trying to emphasize the qualities that a sword had that affected its cutting capacity. That's what I feel is the main driving force that kicked off the development of the falchion. They wanted a sword that could cut better than other swords. In fact, they wanted it to be the most beasty cutter you could imagine. And a lot of the falchion blade profiles are designed to emphasize the specific qualities in a sword that affect cutting. And for what the falchion does, it is amazing. It is a beastly weapon and became very, very popular by the common soldier. And like archers, they loved the falchion. What's less known is that the noble class also loved the falchion. In fact, it was seen as quite a high status item. A lot of the surviving examples are very richly decorated with bronze pummels and even enamel gold inlays on the blade. On the other hand, around the 15th century, the Mesa, that started off as being very much a common man weapon. But then as the Mesa's popularity grew, the noble classes and the uh, higher ups in society started using that weapon as well. Now remember, the falchion doesn't have just the classic Konya's falchion blade design. No, there are many, many other blade profiles that you can find falchions in. Indeed, really any kind of single-edge medieval sword that is built with the handle construction of a sword is a falchion. 
And because it's single edge, you can uh, exploit the advantages that you get out of having a single edge weapon. What are those advantages? Well, please have a look at my video, Single Edge vs. Double Edge Swords. Because the points I talk about in this video are very much emphasized in blade sword design. See what I did then? I'm using the term already. I might be the only one in the world who will. And so what we see with the development of the falchion is really experimentation, okay? People trying out different blade profiles, different shapes, and seeing how that affects its chopping cutting capacity. And they might find, well, this one cuts better in this way, this one uh, is uh, better in the wrist, better balance, and so we get many different blade profiles. And the falchion remained popular and prominent throughout the medieval period from its initial introduction. So then, if it was still around, why did they call a sword that was functionally equivalent to the falchion the Messer in Germany? And a quick note here, Germany was not the central location where the Messer was developed. The development and popularization of the Messer also happened in Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary as well. Now, back to the question, why was the Messer developed when there was an equivalent sword already in existence, the falchion? The most popular answer to this is that in Germany, civilians weren't allowed to carry swords, so if you made the sword in the same way a knife was made, legally it had to be classified as a knife and they were allowed to carry it. That answer is absolutely incorrect. I mean, completely. Verifiably false. Don't get me wrong, it was the opinion I held for a very long time until Mr. Elmsley was kind enough to disabuse me of that incorrect notion. Now really, it shouldn't be too hard for us to realise that this notion that, uh, you know, it was illegal for people to carry swords within Germany within that period, therefore they carried a sword that was a knifey sword and they were allowed to. I mean, really, it just if we look at it logically, we will realise that there's, there's some big holes in that hypothesis or theory. Having said that, I didn't see this logic either until it was kind of pointed out to me, and then I was like, you know, that does actually make sense for, I mean, just for this logical reason. People are not stupid, okay? If it was dangerous, if the general populace felt it was dangerous for regular people to carry around swords, regular civilians, and they wanted to outlaw it, okay, just because you have a sword that's made in the same way as a knife doesn't mean they're going to let you carry it around, that thing is still a bloody sword! Anybody with half a brain would not let them carry it. I don't care what the law says, and it, look, even if, and it doesn't, the Lord never said this, okay? But even if the, Lord's, the law said, you weren't allowed to carry a sword, but you weren't allowed to carry a knife that was as large as a sword, it wouldn't have said that, but even if there was that loophole, okay, they would have changed it. <laughs> And it wouldn't have stuck around long enough to give the Messer the prominence and popularity that it had in medieval Germany. Late medieval Germany, specifically. So there is that simple logical thought. People aren't stupid, okay? And so they're not going to let them carry on that. And even though I'm saying it like it's so obvious, it wasn't obvious to me either, alright? But now that we know, let's clear it up. The next part, okay, is the concept that it was illegal for civilians to carry swords within the time period where the Messer was introduced, and that's around the 1400s. Again, that is verifiably incorrect. Absolutely incorrect, okay? In fact, the exact opposite was the case. Not only was it legal for someone to carry a sword, it was a requirement in the law that they own one. It was a legal requirement for them to own, and in many cases carry, that sword. Here are the references. From the book, The Martial Ethic in Early Modern Germany, Civic Duty and the Right of Arms. I will apologise ahead of time for the horrible pronunciation. Introduction. In 1601, an artisan in Nordlingen named Hans Schwartz was arrested by local council because of a weapons violation. The problem was not that Schwartz had kept or used an illicit weapon, rather his crime was that he did not own a sword. Schwartz was only one of a number of local householders arrested in that year for failing to keep sufficient stores of arms and armour in their homes. The men were given 14 days to honourably arm themselves. In other towns, presentation of proper arms was a requirement of marriage. Throughout Germany during the early modern period, men who failed to keep and bear arms faced fines, imprisonment, banishment and loss of citizenship. No wonder then that the Italian humanist and diplomat Ania Silvio de Pablo, I'm not even going to try it, wrote in his German host in 1444. 
Okay, so this is the 1400s, that every burgher in the guilds had an armory in his house. The skill of the civilians in the use of weapons is extraordinary. At the same time, local authorities also regularly curtailed the right of certain men to wear their swords for a great variety of reasons. In 1543, a military officer lost his sword for life for attacking an opponent who had already fallen to the ground. In the same year, a baker in Orskberg was disarmed for a year because he stabbed a sword into a door. In 1551, a peasant in the village of, not going to try, was condemned to carrying no weapons other than a bread knife with a broken tip as punishment for oath-breaking. Other reasons for banning men from bearing arms included not only political insubordination, but also financial irresponsibility, adultery, theft, idleness, and wife-beating. Clearly the relationship of men to their weapons in early modern Germany, and when, they, when he says early modern Germany here, it, he is clearly referring from 1400s onwards. That's what he's referring to early modern Germany, was symbolic of something more complicated than mere self-defense. So what I've just read to you there was some very meaty stuff, but please stay with me because there's a bit more I want to read to you which really emphasizes this concept of the legality of carrying swords in Germany, in like from 1400s onwards. Reading from the chapter The Open Streets. Private and official places were defined in opposition to public and open places, which included city streets, open roads, and public houses. It was in public that men exercised their freedom to bear arms. What could legally be carried on the street, however, shifted over time. In keeping with medieval constructs of civic peace, many cities imposed restrictions on carrying swords and daggers during the late Middle Ages, specifically at night. I want to emphasize that right there. Most of the restrictions that were placed on carrying swords were actually at night time, not at daytime. As the weapon culture of the early modern towns reached its peak and the side arm became a standard fashion statement, these restrictions were relaxed while newer regulations focused instead on aggressive behavior and on weapons deemed inappropriate for an honorable fight. Local laws in Nuremberg from the 13th century to the 15th centuries were particularly strict, forbidding residents from carrying swords or other weapons entirely on pain of a fine plus the loss of the weapon. Fines were doubled for bringing weapons into public houses the control of which fell to the innkeepers. Exceptions to these rules applied to public officials and travellers on their way in and out of the city, although they also had to leave their swords behind at the inn when they were moving about the city. Otherwise, only ordinary bread knives that are not dangerous and also not too sharp were allowed in Nuremberg. Valentin Grobner suggests that these rules were not really enforced. In any case, Nuremberg's laws were harsh even by late medieval standards. Many other cities allowed their citizens to carry swords during the 15th century. In Augsburg, 14th century laws limiting the length of swords and other blades were loosened for locals in the 15th century to apply only to exposed or unusual weapons, even at night. Nordlingen's restrictions on carrying swords were also limited to non-residents. In other cities, weapons were often limited by length, rather than type. In 15th century Rothenburg, whose laws seem to have rivaled Nuremberg's, only knives with blades up to one quarter, around 15 centimeters or six inches, were allowed. Elsewhere, maximum allowable weapon length seemed to have been appropriate for swords, or at least long daggers, rather than knives. Appropriate blade lengths were sometimes inscribed on the walls of a church, council house, or other public building. So, from these sources, and a couple of other ones that I found online, we can establish that with a couple of exceptions, being one or two cities, it was perfectly legal for people to carry swords in Germany during the late medieval period. Not only was it perfectly legal to carry a sword in Germany during this time, but it was a legal requirement that you own one. It, I, sorry, I, I have to absorb that a bit. It was a legal requirement to own a sword? I'm moving to Germany! So I just got back from Germany. Turns out the laws have kind of changed. The next important fact that we can learn from the source I just quoted is that one of the main ways they determined what was legal and illegal to carry was not the way a weapon was constructed, not the type of weapon, but by length, okay? And so even in the cases where a certain weapon was allowed or wasn't allowed, 
they didn't determine that by, well, that's a sword, you're not allowed it, but I thought, no, it was length, okay? And so if you had a short sword, it would be allowed. If you had a knife that was really long, it would be disallowed, it would be illegal. And so again, the type of construction had no relevance at all to the legality of carrying a sword in late medieval Germany. So these sources have utterly and completely destroyed the idea that the Messer was a loophole in German law to allow a person to carry a larger weapon when swords were illegal. Utterly incorrect! And that brings us back to the question, well then why was the Messer developed? Why did they bother making a difference to the Falchion, which, you know, they could have made a sword, a single-edged sword, and just call it a Falchion. Why did they make it like a knife? Well, I'm not going to abandon you just yet. There is a very compelling answer to that question, and credit given where credit's due, it was Mr. James Elmsley that proposed this to me, and when I heard it, it was very, very convincing, and I'll share it with you, but of course my own words with uh, the additional bits of research that I've done. Now, I was unable to find direct sources that revealed this answer, but there are some significant clues that indicate that the answer as to why the Messer was developed might very well have been this reason that I'm about to share with you. And aside from the clues, it is very intuitive. It makes sense with uh, the state that late medieval Germany was in during the time. And it is in regards to guilds. The answer is specifically in regards to guilds. Now, I'm not referring to World of Warcraft guilds, all right, or any MMO RPG guilds, okay, or thieves guilds or anything, no. Late medieval guilds were about craftsmanship, or they were established by the craftsmen of particular regions. So initially, what would happen, a group of craftsmen who all practiced the same trade would get together and say, all right, how about we say we support one another? I will vouch that you make good quality stuff if you will vouch that I make really good quality stuff. And we will give you a seal of approval. We'll say you're a member of our special, you know, exclusive group, and we'll call it a guild. You are a member of our guild. And so if you're a member of our guild, that means you have the stamp of approval from every other member of the guild. And we all make the same thing, so that qualifies us to be able to tell or say if what you make is of any good quality or not. Well, how about we take a further step? What if we, uh, all agree to raise our prices a little bit. That means everyone has to pay what we're saying that they have to pay for our product, good or service. And if anyone comes along trying to sell something for a cheaper price, or you say, no, nah, we haven't allowed them in our guild, don't trust their workmanship. There's a reason why they're selling it for cheaper, because it's dodgy, don't buy their crap. So you can see the incentives that do exist in making a guild, but they did legitimately regulate quality control. They had reputations to uphold. If you were a member of a guild, you were expected to make something at the right quality. But it was also even more than that. It served as a bit of financial security to the members of the guild. If, a, if one of the craftsmen in the guild fell sick and couldn't you know, work his craft, well, the guild was there to actually help him out a bit financially to get through the period in which he was sick. Now, of course, they did have to, they started to pay a percentage to the guild organization as for being members. So you had to pay to be a member of the guild, but you got a bit of, uh, you know, financial return and security by doing it. And it also gave you reputation, credibility. By you saying you're a member of the guild, people automatically could trust you in your craft. And another thing that a guild did was that they would regulate the amount of craftsmen in any given location. Because again, remember, most people would only go to the craftsmen that were members of the guild because that meant quality. You're getting the right thing. And so by them not allowing certain people to be members of their guild, they could control the amount of craftsmen in a certain city and then control that there was not an oversupply. That meant their goods or services were always in demand. And so guilds became very, very significant in the medieval period. And they also became very, very powerful as well. So of course, the idea spread quite quickly and there was a guild for most crafts in the, in the medieval period. There was a stonecutter's guild, a carpenter's guild, a sword maker's guild, and a knife maker's guild. Now, the difference between stonework and Carpentry is fairly well defined. You're working in completely different mediums, but the difference between knife and sword, well, actually, they're very comparable. So to protect their craftsmen, legal definitions of what they were making were established. They defined, this is a knife. 
And this is a sword. You are only legally allowed to make a knife if you're a member of the Knife Makers Guild. And if you make a sword, well guess what? We're gonna come down on you like a ton of bricks. You're not a member of the Sword Makers Guild, and uh, therefore your qualities are up to scratch, and uh, we can do some all nasty, real nasty things to you to make your life a living hell. But there's a lot of grey area there, isn't there, as to what's a knife and what's a sword. How long can a knife get? before it's not a knife and not a sword. And this is where that idea kind of comes in, that there is a legitimate grey area between what's a knife and what's a sword. And so there is some credibility to the concept that the Messer was developed as a loophole, but not for the legality of carrying a sword, but for the legality of making a sword. Because you have a knife maker who is a member of the Knife Making Guild. And uh, as a member of the Knife Making Guild, he is only legally allowed, as the stamp of approval, to make knives. And the Sword Makers Guild will not let him make swords. But if he looks at the actual legal definition of what is a knife, according to the charters that these guilds would have written up, okay, a full tang, riveted handle, cap, length. There's not much about length there. Okay. Now I'm sure that the Sword Makers Guild would have kicked up a really big fuss about this if the knife makers started making really, really big knives. But what we have as evidence that they mustn't have gotten very far in their legal pursuits is that we have a lot of swords in medieval Germany, late medieval Germany, that are made like knives. And of course those swords are called messes, which is German for knife. So they even called them a knife. At no point did they say, no, this is a sword, but it's, it's a knife. It's just a really, really big knife. It's not a knife, it's a sword. Well, it's made like a knife and under the laws you can't do anything, so up yours. Now, of course, anyone with a brain would know that the knife maker is actually making swords, but if you had to define what a knife was compared to a sword in legal terms and it was already established, and no one had, you know, the foresight to see that, ah, oh, there might be this problem that we're going to see, if the, if the guilds pre-established it and there was this loophole, people, of course, would exploit it. And uh, this really does seem like what has happened. Now, we know that there were many, many swords in Germany in the regions roundabout that were made like knives. So it just makes sense then that it was the knife makers who made these swords. The question that remains is why did the Messer, these knifey swords, become so popular? We know that they did because of all the surviving swords that we have found we can infer some possible answers that are quite speculative at this time. One possibility is that the sword makers jump ship, so to speak. Because from the sword makers' perspective, they can make a sword, but they're not allowed to make a knife. But when they see the knife makers, they can still make their knives, and essentially, they're also making a sword, a knifey sword, that's the same as their product, so now that they're losing customers. But if they join the Knife Makers Guild, they can now make two products, when before they could only make one. There is no direct evidence to indicate this, so this answer is speculative. Another answer is that because the knife makers could now essentially make swords, or get away with making swords, is that the sword makers, instead of jumping ship, tried to get a piece of the pie, so to speak, and so they started providing sword blades to the knife makers, selling them to the knife makers directly, saying, oh look, you can still make, you know, these things, but we'll make the blades, you can make them then like a knife as you want. Now, if we could find out where the blades were made, both on messes and on falchions during this time, we could could find evidence to support this, and there is a little bit of evidence already. For instance, some of the Messer blades that have been found today can be identified to have been made in places like Paso or Paso, sorry for the pronunciation, but this place was normally associated with sword manufacture, not Messer knifey sword manufacture. We know that sword blades were often sent packed in crates to be mounted in the popular local fashions and were traded through all of Europe. The classic Toledo steel is an example of that. Solingen, Poisson, and Brescia all had centers of industry that produced sword blades. And it looks like that some of those workshops or factories in those places were focusing specifically on making Messer blades to market to popular tastes. So what we can infer is that the Sword Makers Guild 
didn't win their battle. They couldn't stop or suppress the knife makers making knifey swords. And we know that simply by the amount of surviving messes that we have today. And so to adapt to that, they started making knifey sword blades to sell to the knife makers. So instead of being able to stop the knife makers from essentially making their own product, they started making their product for the knife makers. They started making sword blades for them. And that does make sense. If you have a consumer who wants to buy the best quality sword that they can get, and a knife maker is saying, well, I'm selling you a Mesa, it's a knife, but it's the size of a sword, but I'm selling you this. If they can say it's made out of the same type of steel as the best type of sword blades, well then they'll have a much higher chance of selling their product, won't they? And so it makes sense that the knife makers would want to get a hold of authentic sword blades for their knifey swords. And so as a person who wants to buy a sword, you would go, all right, who are the people making swords? And from the consumer's mindset, they would know that there's no difference between a knifey sword and a swordy sword. Their handle construction doesn't mean squat to them. And if there is a large group of people making knifey swords, well, that would then obviously create an environment where more knifey swords were used because more were being sold. Using the proper academic terms, of course. And thus we see the rise of the German Messer. Even though, effectively, it is the exact same sword as the falchion. It was just, you know, this fun loophole that does exist uh, from the guilds system, not the legal carrying swords system. Now, does this explain how the Messer was developed? Yes, it is one explanation. Is it correct? I honestly don't know. I think it is far more likely than other explanations that you know, circulate around the internet. Specifically because we have direct verifiable sources that contradict the other ideas or thoughts or explanations as to why the Mesa was developed. And right now, nothing contradicts this potential idea that I've just proposed to you. And indeed, I expect we will actually find more evidence that will confirm it as we do more research in the future. This has been the origin of the Falchion and Mesa. Thank you very much for watching and please follow me on to part four, the real Falchion and Mesa, where I'll be debunking certain erroneous ideas about their form, function, profile and design. I do hope to see you there and farewell. If you would like to support Shadowversity or express appreciation for a video that you particularly enjoyed, please become a patron through Patreon. Your $1 donation would be absolutely wonderful.